Well, hello, Redeemer Reformation Church family. I hope you're having a blessed Lord's Day today and that you find great comfort and hope and strength in Christ and are blessed as you worship our triune God today. And welcome to all who are visiting our YouTube channel today. We hope that you're blessed too as you hear God's Word proclaimed now. And I invite you to uh, turn with me in your God's Word to Genesis chapter 3 for our Scripture reading. Genesis chapter 3. And I'll read the entire chapter, and then we will read uh, from Romans chapter 5. But let's give attention now to God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And then let's hear God's word from Romans chapter 5, uh, where Paul connects us to Adam here. Romans 5 verses 12 through 21 Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. 
And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's sin, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may God add His blessing to His Word as it's proclaimed. And let's uh, also uh, hear our catechism lesson from the Hatterberg Catechism. We're in Lord's Day 3 today. And I'll just read the three questions now from Lord's Day 3 of the Hatterberg Catechism. Did God create man so wicked and perverse? No. God created man good and in His own image, that is, in true righteousness and holiness, so that he might truly know God, his Creator, love Him with all his heart, and live with God in eternal happiness for His praise and glory. Then where does man's corrupt nature come from? From the fall and disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, in paradise. This fall has so poisoned our nature that we are all conceived and born in sin. But are we so corrupt that we are totally unable to do any good and inclined toward all evil? Yes, unless we are born again by the Spirit of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in his book Core Christianity, Michael Horton recalls a time when he says a friend from college sadly lost her daughter to leukemia. And Horton writes that through tears she told me, I don't know if I can believe in a God who made such a messed up world as this. Indeed, this is a messed up world. There's a brokenness, a bentness to this life under the sun. The world is not the way it's supposed to be. Horton says that as a pastor, I've learned that in those times when I hear people say things like this, it's often better for me to just listen. We do not always believe everything we say in our laments to express how we feel in the moment. Nevertheless, her sentiment is one that many people do believe, even apart from those moments of pain and anger. There are plenty of people who think that if there is a creator, he's not very good at his job. And our catechism addresses this problem, this concern that... uh, And it bases its answer on God's own Word. We begin our journey through the catechism with that memorable first question, what is your only comfort in life and in death? And we saw in short that we confess that our only comfort in life and in death is that we are not our own but belong body and soul, both in life and in death, to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. And through His precious blood, we've been redeemed from all our sins and misery, and uh, we belong to the Heavenly Father, God the Father now, as His beloved children, and He keeps us, He preserves us in our redemption, and we also belong to the Holy Spirit who assures us of our redemption and makes us uh, heartily ready and willing from now on to live unto Him. And then the Catechism asked, you know, what do you need to know to live and die in, this, in the joy of this comfort? And three things, the greatness of my sin and misery. And second, how I am redeemed from all my sin and misery. And third, how I'm to be thankful to God for such redemption. We need to know uh, guilt, grace, and gratitude, or sin, salvation, and service. And that's the three parts of our catechism, guilt, grace, gratitude. And we are in the guilt section still at this point in the catechism where the the catechism is exposing the guilt of our sin and our misery. And uh, 
our great need for Christ and His salvation. And last time we saw how the moral law of God is what exposes the sin in our life. It's like a mirror that shows our sinful hearts um, because it requires that we love God and love our neighbor um, perfectly and self-sacrificially as Christ first loved us. And we all fall short of that. Um, But it drives us to Christ um, because He's the one who kept the law and died on the cross to suffer the curse of the law in our place. And the final question of our last uh, Lord's Day, Lord's Day 2, asked, can you live up to all this perfectly? And we confess, no, I am inclined by nature to hate God and my neighbor. Now, you might have read that or you might have heard that answer or others you might be talking to that are unbelievers or whatever that hear that and they say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm inclined by nature to hate God and my neighbor? Well, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. How can he find fault? Well, the catechism that naturally moves into the question that we're considering today, namely, did God create man originally like this? Did God create man so wicked and perverse in the Garden of Eden in the beginning? In other words, uh, like the lament of Mike Horton's friend, did God create a messed up world as the one we live in? And the answer is, as Horton puts it, no, in the beginning God made the world good, but we messed it up. And thankfully God mercifully redeems us in Christ and is restoring the world. And uh, our catechism here provides for us the source of our misery. It shows where the source of our misery and sin and, and all the messed upness comes from. And it also shows us the scope of our misery here. So we'll see the, the source and scope of our misery in this Lord's Day lesson. Uh, but we'll see this in three parts. First, we'll consider the goodness of creation. The goodness of creation. And then secondly, the sin of the first Adam. And then thirdly, the success of the second Adam. But first, notice the goodness of creation. Uh, Since the beginning, man has been playing the blame game. When God confronts Adam in his sin, Adam replies, the woman that you gave to me, she she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. So Adam passes the blame to Eve and, and you can hear in that answer, really he's, He's passing it on to God. The woman, it's the woman who you gave me. She ate it and and then gave it to me. It's her fault. And then when God, God confronts Eve, she replies in a similar fashion, right? The serpent, the serpent deceived me and I ate. It's the serpent's fault. And the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, as they say, right? We today, as descendants of Adam and Eve, still play the blame game. Lord's Day 2 taught us how God's law diagnoses man's basic problem, which is sin. And because of sin, we are inclined to hate God and our neighbor. But this begs the question within us, why are we inclined to? to hate God and our neighbor. Why are we inclined to hate God and our neighbor? Maybe it's not our fault. Maybe we shouldn't blame ourselves for our misery. Maybe we should blame God who created Adam and Eve in the first place and gave them the choice between good and evil. And there's a subtle pride that goes with that too, right? Should you know, surely we wouldn't have messed up. Surely if, it was, if we were the first parents of the human race, we would have done better. Shouldn't we blame God for our predicament? Finger pointing comes easy for us today as well. Today it takes various forms. In some cases we like to blame our nurture. We say things, well, it's not my fault. I I messed up because of the parents I had growing up. See, God, it's the parents whom you gave me that accounts for why I'm messed up. 
Or we blame our brain and say things like, I'm wired this way. I'm just, this is the way I'm wired. I can't help it. We play the blame game on our brain. Or we blame our circumstance in society. You know, don't fault me for my failures. I didn't have the same opportunities for success as others. If I would have had those opportunities, I would have never, I would never have done these things. You can't really fault me. You can't really blame me. I was born into poverty. I was born in the ghetto. I was born in the midst of brokenness. Now, we aren't denying that those things play a significant role in who we are and the choices we make, and we ought to always be compassionate and sympathetic to those things with those who have had a a difficult upbringing, have a mental illness, or were born into poverty, a, a terrible situation in society. But they don't give us an excuse for sin. They don't make us innocent of our transgressions of God's law. One pastor tells a couple of stories of blame shifting in criminal cases. He says that following the execution of serial murderer John Wayne Gacy, medical examiners conducted an autopsy on the killer's body, not in order to determine the cause of death, but in order to determine if some irregularity in his brain was to blame for his demented behavior. Obviously, such an attempt stems from the belief that normal people would never do such things. And the sad reality is people like Gacy are all too normal, right? Because the norm is that we all have a sin nature, each and every one of us. He adds another uh, story, even more bizarre. He says one of, the, one of the most bizarre yet successful attempts at blame shifting occurred in the trial of Dan White, a disgruntled zealot who maliciously shot and killed San Francisco Mayor George Moscone and a councilman by the name of Harvey Milk. At the trial, White's lawyer argued that his client was driven to murder the well-known political figure, get this, because of a sugar high induced by the consumption of numerous Twinkies prior to the crime. That was the, that was the argument. It was because of a sugar high induced by the consumption of numerous Twinkies prior to the crime. It's the Twinkies' fault. He yeah, had strangely enough, this tactic convinced the jury and led to a reduced sentence for White. Proverbs 19.3 puts its finger on the true nature of the problem. A man's folly subverts his way, and his heart rages against the Lord. In the final analysis, the sinner alone is to blame for his sin, ultimately. Well, our our catechism anticipates the blame game when it asks, did God create man so wicked and perverse? And we confess, based on God's word, no. God created man good and in his own image. That is in true righteousness and holiness so that he might rightly know God his creator, love him with all his heart, and live with God in eternal happiness for his praise and glory. The point is that God created man good. There was no fault in man. God did not create man with a sinful nature. And in the creation account, we read this so clearly. Which is God's Word. It says then in Genesis 1.26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. 
It goes on and says, And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. You see, there's no hint of, of sin and evil in the world. Man was created in the image of God in true righteousness and holiness with an abundance of opportunity, more opportunity than anybody has ever had in this world after the fall. There's no hint that God created man wicked and perverse. Rather, man was created in the image of God, male and female, and it was declared very good. And Paul tells us that in Christ, we are being renewed in that image in Ephesians 4.24 to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. He says in Colossians 3.10, put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of of its creator. Notice Paul mentions in those two passages I just quoted, true righteousness, holiness, and knowledge. The very things that our catechism speaks of here. And Paul's implication here in these verses is that man was originally created with these aspects of the image of God. Man was originally created in true righteousness and holiness and with the right knowledge of his creator and able to love and serve him. Furthermore, our catechism mentions that man was able to love God with all his heart and live with God in eternal happiness for his praise and glory. Imagine that. He had the capacity to perfectly obey God. He was able, he was able to fulfill the covenant of works in the garden. And the Garden of Eden was no ordinary garden, as we might think. It was a paradise sanctuary, the original temple and dwelling place of God with man. Adam and Eve lived in a state of blessedness and abundance in the presence of God. Could you imagine that? A place where there's no curse? In other words, there would have been no pain and childbearing, no conflicts between husbands and wives, no toil and pain and working the ground or other jobs that we take where all of creation would have been perfectly subdued under us and there would have been no death and we would have had perfect fellowship with our triune God you see Adam was created in the image of God in this pristine condition and in this pristine state in the blessed holy sanctuary of the garden of Eden In the Garden of Eden, man was crowned with glory and honor as we sang in Psalm 8, verse 5. He was a a king and a priest, and he willfully gave up this state of blessedness. And so God created man very good. That's the goodness of creation. We must affirm that based on God's Word And where then did sin come from? What is the source of our misery? That's our second point here, the sin of the first Adam. Our catechism asks in question seven, then where does man's corrupt nature come from? And we confess from the fall and disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve, in paradise. This fall has so poisoned our nature that we are all conceived and born in sin. That's the source of our sin and our misery. And how bad is it? Well, our catechism goes on and asks, but are we so corrupt that we are totally unable to do any good and inclined toward all evil. And we confess, again, based on God's Word, yes, unless we are born again by the Spirit of God, we are inclined uh, and we are corrupt and totally unable to do any good and inclined toward all evil. That is the scope of our sin and misery. We are totally incapable of delivering ourselves from our sin and misery. And we are totally depraved. Sin taints our whole being, every aspect of of our body and our souls. And so what is the source of our sin? The fall and disobedience of our first parents, Adam and Eve. We read of this fall in Genesis 3, which is a historical account of our first parents, Adam and Eve, where they ate 
the forbidden fruit and transgressed God's law. Adam broke that covenant of works. But what then is the connection between us and them, our first parents? How does their sin, how does Adam's sin affect us? And this is the question that Paul takes up in Romans 5, verses 12 to 21, where he makes this connection that the covenant is that connection. And and Adam was our covenant representative in the garden in what we call in theology the covenant of works. One commentator summarizes the passage in the following way, Romans 5. He says that all people, Paul teaches, stand in relationship to one of two men whose actions determine the eternal destiny of all who belong to them. Either one belongs to Adam and is under sentence of death because of his sin or disobedience. Uh, I'm sorry, I skipped a line here. Um, all people stand in relation to one of two men whose actions determine the eternal destiny of all who belong to them. Either one belongs to Adam and is under sentence of death because of his sin or disobedience. Or one belongs to Christ and is assured of eternal life because of his righteous act or obedience. The power of Christ's act of obedience to overcome Adam's act of disobedience is the great theme of this paragraph. And thanks be to God for Christ, our second Adam, who overcomes our sin and misery that came about as a result of, our, of the first Adam. But before we consider Christ as our second Adam, consider with me the first Adam and, and the consequences that we have because of Him. You see, Adam was not a private person, but a public one. Have you ever noticed that although Eve ate the forbidden fruit first, Paul singles out Adam here as the one who brought sin into this world. And he does that because Adam is the one who was our covenant representative of the entire human race. As Paul says in Romans 5.12, therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin... And so death spread to all men because all sinned. And so Paul begins to answer the question of why we are wicked. And what he is saying is that Adam brought sin into this world and as a result, death entered the world as well. As Paul later says, the wages of sin is death. And God said in Genesis 2, in the day that you eat of it, surely you will die. Paul then tells us that the reason that death happens to all of humanity is that all humanity sinned as well. You see, the explanation of our death is the same as Adam's. Like Adam, death comes to us because we sinned. How is this true? Because all sinned in Adam as their representative. Notice the flow of Paul's thought here in this passage. After a sort of break in his thought in verse 12, Paul continues his thought in verses 18 and 19, and he says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. You see, Paul connects Adam and his one trespass with the condemnation of all men. Because Adam sinned, he says, all are condemned. They're condemned in Adam. In Adam's fall, sinned we all. This representative view that Adam represented us is strengthened by the comparison that Paul goes on to make with Christ. Adam is a representative just as Christ is a representative. There's a close connection in how Adam represents us and how Christ represents us. They are, Adam was a type of the one who was to come, he says. And think about it. How do we receive life? Well, first, we receive the righteousness of Christ imputed or credited to us through faith. Talking about eternal life here. 
How do we receive eternal life? First, we receive the righteousness of Christ imputed or credited to us through faith, apart from our own works, and on the basis of His righteousness, we receive eternal life. And in the same way, we originally received the sin of Adam by His sin being imputed or credited to our account. And on the basis of this sin, we receive death. So righteousness is imputed to us in Christ, and on that basis, the righteousness of Christ, we receive eternal life. On the other end of the spectrum, in Adam, his sin, the guilt of his sin is credited to our account. And on the basis of this disobedience, we receive eternal death in Adam. Furthermore, just as Adam sinned, and because of his sin became corrupt in nature, we too have this sin nature passed on to us because of our guilt in Adam. So Adam sinned and he became guilty of sin and then sin tainted his whole being. He became corrupt in nature. In the same way, his guilt is imputed to us from the time we're in our mother's womb and then this guilt of that sin, the corruption spreads and we have a corrupt sin nature uh, within us and this is what david speaks of in psalm 51 behold i was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me so the bible teaches that from the time of conception every person in this world is guilty in adam and corrupt in nature this is what we call original sin and we can break that up into these two parts original guilt and original uh, corruption that we receive from adam and then from this original sin flows forth all of our actual sins in this world, like water flowing forth from a polluted fountain source. And not only does the Bible teach us these things, original sin, but we know it from experience, don't we? We don't have to teach our children to sin, do we? We don't, we don't need to catechize them to sin. And, and we don't, they don't come to this world out of their mother's womb being the most uh, selfless uh, individuals in the world and uh, wanting to share their toys with everybody and, and serve and love their, their siblings and their mother and their father and using good manners all the time. No, they, they come out as selfish creatures. We all came out as selfish creatures. And we, you know, as soon as we learn the word no, it's our favorite word. And as soon as we learn the word mine, that's our second favorite word. It's mine, Right? And as parents, uh, we have to do the opposite. We have to teach them how to be good, how to be less, how to not be so selfish and to share with others and to love others, right? There's a reason we talk about terrible twos and not the terrific twos. We are born into this world with a sin nature. We aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners by nature. But this, of course, isn't what the culture believes. The culture believes that man is basically good, right? And if we could just get our act together and rally together, we could transform the world into a, a better place. As uh, one theologian puts it, sola bootstrappa, right? We talk about the, the five solas of the Reformation, that we're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone. Well, the world has its own sola, sola bootstrap of, we could just buy our, you know, if we could just pick ourselves up by our bootstraps and get our act together, then we'd have a better world to live in. Or even if we can't do that, you know, people reason, well, surely we, we can get to heaven if we are good enough. But how long have we been trying to transform this world into a better place? And how is that going for us? And God's Word teaches us that when it comes to being good and trying to get into heaven with our good works, God's Word tells us no one is good, no, not one. There's no one who seeks for God. Um, that's Romans 3. Genesis 6, when, at the time of Noah, when God looked at the earth, He said, the Lord, it says, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The Bible clearly teaches in numerous places 
That after the fall, all of us are born into this world guilty and adamant, corrupt in nature. Man isn't basically good after the fall. He doesn't just have a bad example. He is born in this world guilty and adamant and, and corrupt in nature, totally depraved, totally incapable of saving himself. Sin taints his whole being, his thoughts, his words, his deeds, his, his body even. And man is totally unable to save himself from his sins and misery. This is the consequences of the fall. God made the world good and we messed it up. And we are all conceived with the guilt of Adam's sin and corrupt and a corrupt nature. And from this flows forth all our actual sins. And the wages of sin is eternal death. But thanks be to God, that's not the end of the story, right? Thanks be to God that the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that's the good news. And we've seen here the goodness of creation, the sin of the first Adam. Now third, notice with me, the success of the second Adam. Whenever I think of the theology of the first and second Adam, I often uh, remember a meme that I once saw on social media, a Lord of the Rings meme and uh, in the Lord of the Rings trilogy there's a moment in the fellowship of the ring where the fellowship has begun their long journey to take the ring to Mordor to be destroyed and they are tired from traveling and not eating much and one of the hobbits Pippin asks when are we going to have breakfast to which the man and future king Aragorn replies We've already had breakfast. And Pippin says, yes, but what about second breakfast? And it's a pretty funny moment. And then Mary, his buddy, says, I don't think he knows about second breakfast, uh, Pippin. And Pippin says something like, well, what about, what about, uh, what about elevensies? And what about tea? And what about uh, what lunch and uh, supper and dinner? And it <laughs> goes down through the list. And... Um, this meme is uh, based on that scene and brings in a theological point that we're trying to make here. Um, it has in this meme a picture of Aragorn and Pippin, and, and Aragorn in this meme is saying, quoting from 1 Corinthians 15, in Adam all die. And Pippin is saying, yes, but what about second Adam? And I just love that uh, meme. It's a perfect meme for me. When you put uh, Lord of the Rings and uh, theology, you know, first, second Adam theology together in one meme, I mean, that just uh, warms the cockles of my heart, as my professor used to put it. And uh, in a similar way, the covenant of works in the Bible says to us, in Adam all die. And the covenant of grace then says to us, the gospel says to us, yes, but what about second Adam? The second Adam is our only hope. And the second Adam, Christ, is already foreshadowed in Genesis 3.15 when it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. As our second Adam, Christ, came into this world to crush the serpent's head and to reverse the work of the first Adam and take us from a state of probationary testing to a state of redemption and consummation in our justification our guilt that we had in adam and because of our own sins is removed and we are declared righteous on the basis of christ's life death and resurrection and this also guarantees that the corruption that remains will progressively be removed as the Holy Spirit who dwells within us will renew us in the image of Christ. And our justification in Christ also guarantees that one day when Christ returns, we will perfectly be like Him in consummate glory to enjoy abundant eternal life in the new heavens and new earth. You see, in Christ we've been given the right to eat of the tree of life. In Genesis 3, he didn't have that right. He, he, he lost it. He was stripped from having that right. And he, he had to earn it in the first place, and he never ate it. And that's implied at the end of Genesis 3, which we don't have time to get into. 
But at the end of, Genesis, of the Bible in Revelation 22, we see that we have the right to eat of the tree of life. All who are washed in the blood of Christ have that right. Now, many complain that it isn't, isn't fair that Adam was our representative, but what should really surprise us is that God so loved us that He freely gave us a second Adam, even His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For those who don't like being represented by another person and think that it isn't fair of God, we have to ask, well, what do you do with Christ then? If it's fair and just for Christ to represent you and you appreciate that, then it's fair for Adam to represent you in the first place. And ultimately, God is the standard of justice. And so simply embrace the good news in Christ. The good news is that there is another representative offered to us freely, Jesus Christ, the second and last Adam. And if you place your faith and trust in His work, then you no longer are in Adam, but are in Christ. And what does that mean? Well, Paul the Apostle loved to speak of us being in, in Christ and says it about 80 times or so in his writings, but here's a sampling of it. He says in Galatians 2.16, we are justified by faith in Christ. Romans 3.25, we have redemption in Christ. Ephesians 1.17, we have the forgiveness of our sins in Christ. In Romans 6, we are alive to God in Christ. In Romans 6, we, are, we have eternal life in Christ. In Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. In Romans 8.39, Nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ. Romans 12, we are one body in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, we are sanctified in Christ. 1 Corinthians 4, we are wise in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall be made alive. Galatians 3, in Christ we are all sons of God through faith. 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And that's just a sampling of what it means to be in Christ. The good news of the gospel is that what Adam lost, Christ regained and took it to a whole nother level. Indeed, Ephesians 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You see, not only did Christ regain paradise for us, he earned for us a better paradise. One where we are given the right to eat of the tree of life. One where there will be no possible threat of another fallen curse. In Christ, we have an inheritance, as we hear in our first Peter sermon today, we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. You see, in redemption in Christ, we aren't merely taken back to the Garden of Eden in a state of probation, back in Adam's position, having to fulfill the covenant of works. No, we are in a covenant of grace. And in Christ, we are brought to a state of consummation in the new heavens and new earth. Christ fulfilled the covenant of works that Adam failed to fulfill. Christ passed the test for us. Where Adam failed, Christ succeeded and thus earned for us the righteousness that we need to enter consummate glory. It's ours now in Christ if we have faith. And so the bad news is indeed bad, but how much better then is the good news in Christ. And this is Paul's whole point in Romans 5. He wants to explain our relationship to Adam, but more importantly, he wants to explain the work of the second Adam. Adam's sin brought death, but the free gift of grace in Christ is far better in every way. Where Adam's act brought condemnation and eternal death, Christ's act brought righteousness and eternal life. It's just like how when a king is victorious, he is victorious for his whole people. So too, Christ was victorious for us, and so we rejoice in the victory of our King, which is also our victory. And so what is the source of our sin and misery? Adam, and our original sin in Him. And what is the source of our righteousness and joy on the flip side? It's Jesus Christ, our second Adam. And it's all a free gift of grace to be received by faith alone in Christ alone. The only question that remains is, are you in Adam or in Christ? And if you have not trusted in Christ for salvation, you remain condemned in Adam. 
But if you trust in Christ alone for salvation, then you are in Christ. You've been born again by the Spirit. And this is your new identity. You are no longer in Adam. You are in Christ. In the words of Michael Horton once again, these then are the two grand narratives in Adam and in Christ. One is a narrative of pointless rebellion against a good God and His creation, leading only to frustration and death. The other is a narrative of redemption and reconciliation, consummated in everlasting life with the triune God in a restored cosmos. The good news is that God is in the business of baptism, submerging sinful selves in Christ's death and then raising them up with Christ in newness of life. And dear Christian, this is your ultimate identity. What is your ultimate identity? It's not your ethnicity. It's not your job. It's not your family. It's not your spouse. It's not your children. It's not your favorite hobby. It's not what society says about you. It's not what your worst critics say about you, nor is it what your biggest fans say about you. It's not even what you say about you. It's not your past or present sins, nor is it your past or present successes. It's not your circumstances in this world. And so what then is your ultimate identity? Your ultimate identity is what God's Word says about you in Christ. And if you have faith in Christ, then God's Word declares your true identity, which is this, you are in Christ. And if you are in Christ, you are forgiven of all your sins and are dearly loved by the God of the universe, and your future is bright. And so therefore, put off your old self in Adam and put on the new self in Christ and walk in newness of life by the Spirit. Obey God in gratitude for His amazing grace in Christ. And rest in the truth of God's Word that no longer does Adam's story define you. Christ's story ultimately defines you. Your ultimate identity is in Christ and you are united with Christ forever. And one day you will see Christ face to face and be like Him and will forever dwell in consummate glory. No longer in a world that is messed up, but in a new world where consummate love and joy and peace dwells forever under the rule of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and King. Let us look forward to that day and pray, Lord Jesus, quickly come. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank You for the good news once again as it's proclaimed to us. We thank You for the work of our second Adam. Help us to rest in Him this day. Help us to rejoice in Him, our victorious King and Savior. Help us to serve Him all the days of our life and to obey all that He commands of us in gratitude. May we know that our ultimate identity is in Christ. May we live out of that identity. And may we press on by Your Holy Spirit who sustains us and strengthens us and preserves us in this identity. Father, we hear now our prayers of supplication. We pray that COVID cases would go down in our province and throughout the world. Strengthen healthcare workers at this time and keep them healthy as they care for the sick. Keep us as a church healthy and safe as well. And uh, may we not be afraid, but uh, rest in our identity in Christ during these troubled times and share that hope with others and help our economy to recover from the current crisis and provide jobs for those who are in need at this time. Help us be generous with those in need. And Father, we pray that You would uh, be with our married couples at this time, strengthen their marriages. May they be a picture of Christ and the church and that relationship and magnify the Gospel. May they find the power and the pattern to live uh, in blessed harmony in their marriage. We pray for engaged couples. We remember Josh and Janae. We pray that you continue to be with them and prepare them for marriage, to love one another in Christ-like ways, keep them pure. And we pray also for uh, Matthew and Jim Min, newlyweds. We continue to pray that you strengthen them in their new marriage in Christ. Please bless the relationship between parents and children. May parents find strength to love and care for their children even during troubled times, even when their 
children are, are sinful towards them and don't honor them as they ought. May parents be patient and um, forgiving. Also, may they discipline their children in love as you would have them. And uh, may our children um, grow in Christ. May they, may they love Him. May they trust in Him. And may they, by your Spirit, grow in maturity in Him. And so strengthen the bonds between parents and children. And uh, we pray for our expectant mothers, Joanne Williams and Jen Hornoy. Please give them what they need of at this time in their pregnancy. Keep their babies healthy in the wombs and bring about a safe and healthy delivery. We pray for those who are fostering children at this time. We pray that you would strengthen them in that um, and continue to give them a heart of compassion and mercy and, and patience and love for those in their home that they're fostering. And we pray that you would find a, a, provide for these foster children healthy, stable families to take care of them and love them and that they would know Christ and know through Christ you, our Heavenly Father, who is Father of the fatherless. And we pray for those considering or planning to adopt children as well, that you would be with them and um, help them in that process. We pray for those struggling to have their own children, perhaps. Uh, grant peace and contentment with your will and patience in adversity. Help us to weep with them and help them to also rejoice with others who have children. May we all be spiritual fathers and mothers to the children of the church. And, and Father, we pray for those who are single, that they would find contentment and joy in Christ during their singleness. If they desire to be married, help them to find a faithful Christian spouse. If they desire to remain single, may they find strength and joy in that calling as well. May we be a church where singles feel welcome and loved. Father, we thank you also for the gift of our federative unity we have with other churches in the URC and A. We thank you for the bond of fellowship that we have in Christ, to grow us in maturity in Christ as a federation of churches, preserve the peace and unity of our churches, especially during these troubled times, and help us to be a light for Christ and to spread the good news of the gospel. We especially pray for those churches without a minister of the word that you would lead them to the man of your choosing soon that will faithfully proclaim your word to them and administer the sacraments and raise up more men for the gospel ministry, strengthen reformed seminaries and keep them faithful to Christ, His gospel and His church. Almighty God, who's promised to hear the petitions of those who pray in Your Son's name, we ask You mercifully to incline Your ear to us who have now made our prayers and supplications to You. Grant that those things that we have faithfully asked according to Your will may be obtained to the relief of our needs and to the setting forth of Your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen.